Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor Zoltan Ace. Did I get your name, your last name correct? Let's pronounce it Ach. Ach. Say it again. Ach. Ach. Zoltan. Ach. Ach. Rhymes okay. with Scotch. Oh, Ach. Oh, Zoltan Ach. <laughs> yes, Ach. It's easy to, to, to pronounce. I Okay, then. So how are you doing, Zoltan? I'm oh, fine, thank you. <laughs> oh, Zoltan. Where are you? I'm in Jamaica. I'm in St. Andrew in Jamaica. Okay. Yeah, and you're one hour ahead, so it's nine my time and I'm right. in your time. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So when you see Zoltan, I interview a lot of people from Germany. Germany has some really interesting researchers. So now I'm usually... It does. I, yeah. yeah, so because I'm so accustomed to interviewing Europeans, I, I get up quite early <laughs> because they they tend to be seven or eight hours ahead. And if the That's person right, is in yeah. Japan, I have to get up like at 1 a.m. <laughs> but it's not a problem. So Zoltan, yeah. you have written some really interesting papers, and today we'll be talking about two, two of them quite briefly. The first piece is titled The Evolution of the Global Dig Digital Platform Economy, 1971 to 2021. And Z Z Zoltan, the name of this research, it sounds quite ordinary, but I read it. And it's interesting because of the abstract. There's a sentence in the abstract that really grabs my attention. European incumbent firms have not introduced new technologies in sufficient volume and startups there have remained small and not scalable. What's going on in Europe? Well, it's a complicated story. Um, but the basic idea is that the economic theories that influenced Europeans in the last 50 years have recognized the importance of knowledge and the digital economy. But the Europeans thought that existing companies would be the ones that would introduce these new technologies. And in a nutshell, what has happened is the existing companies have not introduced these technologies in sufficient numbers for the Europeans to keep a pace of both the US and Asia. Yes, Zoltan. Some time ago, I read ITIF report, and because I was so inspired by that report, I wrote a piece on small businesses. But I think an issue in Europe is that they tend to invest in competitive small firms. But according to studies, if the structure of the American economy reflected the European economy, Americans would be poor because um, the American economy is is impacted by more high growth and global firms in contrast to Europe. That's, that tends to be dominated yes. by smaller firms. Yes. I mean, the Europeans are very interested in small business. So if you, you know, look at countries, um, the Europeans have <clears throat> at least as large a part as the US or larger of small businesses in their economy. So it's not that they're opposed to small business, they're opposed to entrepreneurship, right? And, and where a lot of people convolute these two and use the terms interchangeably, you know, small business is really about a business that is not big however you want to define small and big, right? But entrepreneurship is really about innovation and bringing something to the market that doesn't exist. And the Europeans love small business, but they want innovation to be done by existing large corporations and therefore separate out <clears throat> entrepreneurship from innovation. It's what the Japanese do. The Japanese and the Germans on this are identical. Yes, the, the, the Germans, 
they're famous for very small businesses. The oh, the middle, I guess. Yeah, these, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but so anyway, so that's the basic story of the difference between the Europeans and the Americans. Zoltan, you said something quite poignant that Europeans are opposed to entrepreneurship. And some years ago, I read a piece published by the Cato Institute lamenting that France was a regulatory state. Why right. do the Europeans take a negative approach to business development? Well, that, that's a tough question. <laughs> Um, and I suspect the answer to that is all about control. So, you know, the problem with entrepreneurship is that, right, this is something that is promoted or accepted by a society or rejected. And, and the reason it's controversial is because when entrepreneurs become wealthy, they challenge the status quo. You know, just take a look at very wealthy people that have made their money. Um, by starting businesses, <clears throat> they become very influential and very powerful and they're hard to control. So why the US actually doesn't care if new firms come, people become billionaires, we're, we're fine with that. Most countries are not happy with that. And so the structures and the institutions that are set up, right, are meant to keep things in place. And entrepreneurs would have said that. So Europeans make it easy to start businesses, but very difficult to grow them. Where the US, it's easy to grow businesses. Zoltan, is this historical? So for, so, so for instance, the G G Germany had an aristocracy like France and many other countries in Europe. America was settled by migrants who wanted to trade and innovate, and many of these migrants were also fleeing religious persecution. So, did so? So, yeah. I'm wondering if the absence of a permanent aristocracy enables entrepreneurial growth in America. You know, that is a very insightful question. And historians have written right, about America and why it's different. And you're right. One of the things they argue is that there was no aristocracy here. So America had middle class values where Europe had aristocratic values. Right? And just take a look at two things. Take a look at food. Right, Europeans have a much greater inclination for fancy food, you know, good food, you know, especially the the Romance countries, you know, France, Portugal, Italy, but but, but even some of the other countries where the Americans eat junk, and they're fine with it, right? And same with cars. Right. Why do the Europeans make all the luxury cars and America makes cars to the middle class? Well, it's because we have middle class values. Right? We don't respect people in America that don't work, even if you're a billionaire. In Europe, if you don't work, oh, you're just a member of the aristocracy. So this issue, yes, it is important, I think. And uh, Zoltan, another key point is the education system. In America, trade schools were actually re revered, whereas in Germany and France, people preferred PhD. The Germans popularized the PhD program. So maybe another yeah. issue is that Americans value education, but they prefer human capital. So education is getting the degree. Yes. Human capital is yes. translating education into profit. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right on that. And if you go back to the 
17th and early 18th centuries, right? The university in Europe was all about studying Greek and Roman, about educating priests, um, maybe lawyers they were needed, right? It really wasn't about building a country, right? Where in the US, <clears throat> the education system focused on the basics, right? Agriculture, mechanics, engineering, <clears throat> um, road construction, education, teachers. And so it had a much bigger emphasis on how to make the middle class more productive and therefore more entrepreneurial. But even when Americans studied Greeks and Rome, it was a form of applied history. So they wanted to know yes. where the Greeks went wrong, why their yes. economy did not succeed. So Americans right. never study ancient history in isolation. They often right. try to appropriate suitable policies to build a future country. Yes, yes. So that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, a, a, a big part of this story is that people came to America from Europe and Asia and other countries to basically create a future for themselves, to do things, to grow, to change, to get rich. Um, and we were okay with that. Those people that came were welcome. Those that didn't stayed home. And so you had this large, and you know, this is still, this was still true in this last digital um, evolution. Um, you know, when you studied Silicon Valley, it was full of people from all over the world. You know, there were Indians, there were Chinese, there were Brits, there were Germans, there were Swedes, there were Koreans. Um, it was a in, you know, in some sense, it was an American story, but it was a global effort. It just happened to take place in the United States. And then there's also the matter of egalitarian individualism in America. America was identified by writers like Tocqueville as a free society. People didn't judge you based on your religious or tribal identities. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean... We know that, right, economic freedom is different, separate from political freedom. And we know that you have to have economic, right, in a middle class country, you need economic freedom first for people to become successful. And then they'll want political freedom. It's not the other way around. And both America and China have followed this model um, where if you give people political freedom but no economic freedom you've really forced them into the existing structure those and i find it a bit odd sometimes that people often discuss entrepreneurship in america without reverting to its cultural roots so so again we can talk about the founding fathers on average, they were not in favor of a big state, and many of them were even critical of democracy. So one of yes. the reasons why entrepreneurship has done so well in America is that the founding of America is innately individualistic and pro-economic freedom. Yeah, yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, people came here to escape these structures, you know, that existed in many places. And when they came here, it was basically, and, and you, you know, look, there's this other part of this American story that was told by, <clears throat> oh, what's the guy's name? Um, but Turner. Um, the, closing Turner of, the, the, the closing of the American frontier, right? Oh, yes. His theory was that America succeeded because of the frontier. And the frontier had three, characteristics um right and one of those characteristics was a lack of rules and structures right 
The other characteristic was free resources. You know, land, furs, minerals, I mean, they're for the taking. And the third one was diversity in that it was a mixture of people from all different backgrounds and persuasions and religions, and they were all free to do what they wanted. So it was, and you know, in Europe, there were no free resources because land was all under right the aristocracy. Um, there was a lot of rules dating, like feudalism was nothing but a set of rules. And there was very little diversity because, you know, there was not a whole lot of movement of people one way or the other. Zoltan, I don't know if you are aware, but the Turner thesis has been tested. It has been replicated for Japan and the States. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. empirical truth to what he said years ago. Frontier societies are actually more innovative yeah. and individualistic. Zoltan, you are a leading researcher in the field of entrepreneurship. So I, I'm not asking you for a prediction, but can you tell us why other countries have failed to replicate Silicon Valley? Well, the interesting question is how many Silicon Valleys do you need? Yes, that's another question. Right, and so, so the answer is, you know, this is like the old answer of why you couldn't have socialism in every country. And the answer was you needed one country to set the prices. <laughs> Because right in socialism, you don't know what the prices are going to be because there are very few markets. So I did you need more than one Silicon Valley, right? Or did people just come here from all over the world that wanted to be a part of this evolution of this digital platform economy and pursue that goal here? So I used to have this debate in Scandinavia a lot, right? They'd be pretty good at starting companies. But if you wanted to grow it, you would then move to Silicon Valley. Why did you have to do that? Because those companies and people and structures that you needed to do that didn't exist in Europe. So if you want to grow your company, you came to America. Um, yeah, but uh, Zoltan, for Sil Silicon Valley succeeded because it embedded failure. Failure is a part of entrepreneurship. Yes. And some yes. years ago, Megan McArdle, she wrote that book, Failing, failing Was the Key to Success. Most yeah, yeah, countries yeah, yeah. do have a problem with failing. And well, look, <laughs> yes, you, as you know, most countries don't allow you to fail. You know, business failure is actually outlawed in many places or forbidden or they put you in jail it, it, it's a uh, you know I I remember trying to advise the British government once that they should only put money into new businesses if the owner had failed three times in the past and they were horrified that I would even suggest the idea you know, that, you know, and the failure is really an Asian concept, right? It comes from that famous Chinese general, Tao, or I forget his name, um, where he said, failure is the greatest victory. And, and so, you know, allowing failure, people learn um, how to do things that you normally would not if we didn't allow you to fail. Innovation, the trial and error process. If you yes. don't fail, yes. maybe you cannot succeed. And I'm happy that you referenced insolvency legislation because some countries actually penalize failure. Yes. So for example, oh, no, 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 no. In, in, uh, in, in Jamaica in the 1990s, there was a financial crisis. And years later, J Jamaica went back to the IMF and the insolvency law had to be reformed because the previous law penalized people for failing. 
It was some yeah. one minister referred to the fit and proper rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so you know, this is what I mean by rules and regulations that allow experimentation, trial and error, and you know, you either forbid this or <clears throat> you make it so difficult or I, I, should, I should say is you try to control it centrally so when a lot of countries say oh yes we need these high growth companies we need digitalization we need all this and they say let's put, put it into place but you can't make this up right you have to let um, people try to work this out because, you know, in hindsight, when you read my paper, you say, oh, this looks so simple. We invented the semiconductors, then we invented PCs, then the internet, then the smartphone, and then cloud computing. And, and you know, it's very, so, you know, well, it all seems very simple in hindsight. But now if I ask you, what's the... 1920s of the the 2020 is going to bring the answer is oh, we don't know right if i ask you to fill in the sixth decade this decade what is going to be the big innovation and who's working on it and who's going to succeed you know another way to ask that question is where is the next google of course, the next, the next Google is not a search engine. We don't know what the next Google is because we don't know what it's going to bring. So, so this is why entrepreneurship is important. Figuring out, inventing the future. Someone has to do it. And many countries don't want to allow people to invent the future. And this is why they often fail to create the next Google because we don't know the next Google. Therefore, when, yeah. you, when we invest billions in a program to gain the next Google, such programs are often infeasible and, un and unsuccessful because the next Google right. could be a leisure pro product. Look at Twitter. We, we, don't, we have no idea. Right. Yeah, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. These are le leisure yeah. pro products. Right. But, but at the same time, they're quite influential businesses. There's an argument that innovation is declining, but I don't share the view. My my own position is that we're at a we're we're at a very high stage of civilizational complexity. Therefore, there is a greater demand for leisure products. So maybe the nature of innovation is being transformed. Yeah. I actually thought of this a lot during the pandemic. And about a quarter of the economy is leisure and entertainment. I, I didn't think it was that big, but you know, all sports is leisure and entertainment. Much recreation is leisure and entertainment. All television, all movies are leisure and entertainment. All music is leisure and entertainment. Um, Resorts, concerts, right? Restaurants, right? Many restaurants are just entertainment. If you add all that up, it's probably a quarter of the economy. And, and so you're right, we don't know what the next. Yeah, what the, what the next thing. What the next century will look like. And the, well, the might... next decade, I, I wouldn't even the next century, you can't think of. It's this decade, right? I remember in 2002 asking the question, what is that decade going to bring? And nobody knew until the middle of the decade, right? Then you get the smartphone and then it's like, oh, what's this, right? And then within a few years, you have the apps and all of a sudden, right, we went from a phone to a smartphone, which really isn't a phone, right? It's a digital device. 
um, or, or actually it's a supercomputer, right? Depends how you want to define this. So everybody has a supercomputer in their hand now. You know, and what does, and you know, we know this when you look at the transistors on a chip, right? When the first PC came out, it had 4,000 transistors. Your PC, your smartphone now has something like 40 billion transistors on it. That's why it can do almost anything. So, what's next is an, in this decade is an, interesting question and for for more moreover Zoltan we cannot discredit the influence of influencers many of these yeah. young people on TikTok TikTok they are extremely powerful brands yes. take them seriously leading economists take them seriously I and in my interview with Addis with Tyler Cohen we discussed the attention economy and its relationship to Addison Ray she's a popular young woman on TikTok yeah that's the future yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe within the next two years or even a few months from now, you're going to be doing a paper on Addison Ray. The Wall Street, she has been profiled by the Wall Street Journal. The reality is that uh, the leisure economy is the future. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the four-day work week that people now talk about, deep thinking that people talk about, right? All of these things are, you know, and then... More leisure time, better work balance. Yes, mindfulness. Mean, mindfulness, although I never know what that word means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, some scholars think that it is quite dubious. I don't really take it seriously either. Um, you know, someone said, oh, it's another word for a yoga studio. Sounds better. <laughs> yeah, m- mindfulness. But, but, but Zoltan, I, I, I'm thinking, oh, okay, and oh, should we describe the nexus between the attention economy and the digital economy. What's going to happen? I, I, I can't formulate the right theory at the moment. No. What? I, I don't know. The yeah. To that. And, and the reason is I'm not sure what the attention economy is. Hmm. So, you know, the digital, you know, the, the, the digital economy is, is really a technology. Right. So what we developed was a technology over, and, and you know, there was a very interesting article in, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, the shortage of chips, right? So if you look at this <clears throat> evolution of the platform economy, it's all built on chips. Right. And what the chips do is they get embedded in all sorts of products. And we kept talking for years, as you know, about running out of oil. And it turns out we never ran out of oil because no matter what, we find more oil, you know. But we're running out of chips. This is the great big story that has sort of come out of the pandemic, right? There are chips in games. There are chips in not just your car. There's chips in your refrigerator, your toaster, your TVs, a bunch of chips are everywhere. And the demand for chips greatly increased because people wanted more of these digital products. And I don't know if the chip shortage, how real it is, but we know that governments are now trying to fix this with money, with more factories, more fabrication plants. But this article sort of implied that the chip shortage is here for a while because we just don't have enough chips to keep the digital economy going. So it's slowing it down. But the upside of this is that the shortage of chips may compel us to find an alternative that could be even better. We, we never know. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah. Me, 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 and, and again, chips at the present moment are effective, but because we're accelerating at such a rapid rate, 
at some point we may need another innovation that's superior. Yes, yes. Um, and, y- y- you know, the issue is really data, the storage, transmission, and the processing of data, because that's what lowers information, right? Or the cost of information, right? Once you make information cheaper, a lot of things are possible. So, you know, you know what hitchhiking is, right? Yes. <laughs> right. Um, well, what was hitchhiking? Well, it was trying to get home um, by relying on the good nature of someone else. Uber is really a replacement for hitchhiking, right? There's this platform and on your phone, you know, at two o'clock on a Saturday night, you come out of the bar and you're drunk and you take your smartphone, you click a few keys and within 10 minutes, right? A car shows up to drive you home. What? makes that possible, right, is the storing and the transmission of information and data. And that today, right, is stored in chips. Um, And, you know, the chip storage, I'm I'm sorry, the information storage we solved, you know, and it was solved through chips. We can store everything and there's no limit. You know, if you think of YouTube videos, how many can we store? And the answer is there's no limit. So we... Now, is it the, right, what's the next sort of medium that's going to store this data? And, you know, people are talking about new types of chips that will store information in atoms or, you know, or or in biological structures. So that underlying technology that is the microprocessor, you know, that's just superseding transistors, which superseded vacuum tubes. Um, So, you know, this move toward the information economy really started with the telegraph, you know, 150 years or 200 years ago. And we've just continued to progress along this path. But the question is, what's the next social thing it does? And it may very well be that, you know, if you think of the factory today, there are no people in the factories, really. You know, the only factories with lots of people are meat processing plants um, and some assembly plants in Asia. You know, most factories today are automated. Um, The computer does most things. And so I can see us moving toward a medieval world where leisure becomes the norm. And the only question people have is how to fill my leisure time. And, you know, the Middle Ages were full of that. There's a problem there was nobody was making um, there, there were no computers to make things, so therefore nothing was really made. We live in a world where all this stuff can be made and people can focus more on leisure. So I can see us going to four-day work week, um, maybe a lot of people even less than that. Um, you know, this, this talk about a guaranteed income is part of this debate. And the growth of the leisure industries is also a part of this debate. The thing you got to keep in mind, however, is you need about 10% of the people to make this all work, right? And and those are the creative, smart people. Um, And you know, whether they're 10% or 15% of the economy doesn't really matter that much, but they're the ones that keep the thing going, right? So the tool of the 21st century is writing code. That, that's, the, that's the skill. And if you can't write code today, you're serving food in a restaurant. 
<laughs> Zoltan, coding is important. Do you code? Pardon me? No, Do no, I don't know how to code. I don't code. But I, I understand this. You know, coding is a general way I think of it. It's not just coding, but right. Programming, you know, software is is what keeps everything going. Zoltan, I, I, I do share your concern that coding is significant and those who cannot code may be at a disadvantage. But as someone who has been a professor for a long time, I'm sure that you are aware that people who are able to extrapolate often do better than those who do not. So for yes. example, an engineering, a CEO of an engineering company is more than likely to have a degree in engineering, but someone with a degree in philosophy can assemble a team to create the engineering company. And I think that a skill that, that may be lacking today is the ability to extrapolate. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I think that's a, that's a very valid point. Um, but, you know, I'm going to, venture out on the limb just a bit. You know, only about 15% of the population can do math. Right, because as a logical part of the brain, everybody can recognize pictures, right? And the great success of the digital age is the iconization of society that married that to the pictorial part of the brain. And the reason that's interesting is that our pictorial part of our brain has been developing for 10 million years. The analytical part is only about 10,000 years old. So a much smaller number of people can do analytics than pictorial and what the way we've organized right the digital world is there are those people that create the math the coding whatever you want to call it right and the rest use pictures and that's how we've been able to bring the whole world into the digital age is through pictures right take a look at app every app is a picture basically and the two-year-old can recognize their app on their mother's iPhone. But we have to marry quantitative skills with qualitative skills and creativity. But but yeah. Zoltan, I've all I've often one wondered. Some people say they're smart and maybe their intelligence is demonstrated by academic qualifications. But I've often said if you have a degree in engineering or you're a brilliant mathematician, why are you not rich? Well, this is an old story, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's slightly a different subject, but yes, uh, I, I I fully appreciate that. It's a so Carl. I don't maybe Carl Icahn is adept at mathematics, but I'm sure that he did a PhD in philosophy. Oh, yeah. Well, look, those skills are also very important. So it doesn't mean, you, you know, we don't want to overemphasize this, but, you know, we know that the only thing that matters in entrepreneurship is what the best and the brightest do. Yes. Nothing else matters, right? It doesn't matter what everybody else does. And the question is, right, how do the best and the brightest, <clears throat> um, or when do they engage and become creative and entrepreneurial? And look, we know Einstein used to have this famous saying that creativity is the scarcest talent. The rest is math. Anybody can do that. So even within that right it's creativity that is scarce um and people that can do math they just say well what do you want me to figure out i'll figure it out mm -hmm. and the question is no we need you to be creative to invent something and ah that's much 
tougher. Mm -hmm. And there, all those other skills of engagement, et cetera, are all, are all really important. Just look at Pet Rock. Pet Rock is just a rock that looks pretty, but it turned the founder into a multimillionaire. I know, yeah. So, so that, that was, that's creativity. The, the future- And, and good marketing. <laughs> the, the, the future belongs to the brilliant and to the creative. If you attend MIT and your degrees in philosophy or, or economics, but you are inept at extrapolating, you're not going to become the next yeah. Bill Gates. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and, 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 and I'm saying this to indicate that philosophy may not be in demand, but many philosophy graduates and majors could be fixating on the wrong problems. Yeah. So the, the well, ethics well, of artificial intelligence, that's big business today. Yeah. Because of the pandemic, yep. maybe philosophers need to write more on loneliness. Therefore, the, the philosophers with an entrepreneurial mindset, they're going to win. The, the, the ones who expect, to, who expect to be rewarded because they have a PhD main are not going to do as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just like YouTube. We're yet to exploit the full potential of YouTube. And I think that in the near future, because of the pandemic, YouTube, YouTubers will be producing more short clips that are, that are like series, not reality TV series, series but actual right. low-cost shows. Yeah. But... Yeah, this is all part of that entertainment idea. Like, how do we keep people entertained? And how big a part of our economy is that? Uh, a question for, 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 for you, Zoltan. If you were a young man today, what would you study? Oh, I have no idea. Look, if you're really smart, um, it may make less of a difference what you study. Exactly. But, but here's what I know, and you could do this. Take the 20 most important entrepreneurial companies of the last 50 years. And I'll give you two examples, right? One is Papa John's Pizza, right? That became a multi-billion dollar company. Dell Computers. Um, but take all these founders and go back and look at their education and their upbringing. And you'll discover a couple interesting things. Just like an athlete, right? How do you become the best tennis player or the best golfer or the best baseball player in the world? You start at age two. Same thing with entrepreneurs. People that want to have a great impact on the world, they start very young. Now, they don't all study math and engineering, but they almost all do. But they're also knowledgeable about other things, right? They're generally very clever people. Um, so yes, math isn't the most important, but having that and a lot of and cognitive skill is hugely important. Yes, G as a G as a measure of cognitive ability is important. So when I was a student, I did a few quantitative subjects. I my appreciation for mathematics came later, longer after I, I, I left school. But yeah. you, you said that people who are talented, they start really young. So my degree, Zoltan, is actually in history. I've never mm -hmm. done a course in economics. And yeah. I keep telling that to my guests. I'm not an economist. Like I wrote a piece right. once and someone referred to me as a professor. No, I am not a professor. <laughs> I don't have a PhD, Zoltan. But I started yeah. to read serious books mm -hmm. at a young age. So at six, right. I was interested in Confucius and Du Bois. <laughs> so, Interesting, yeah. yeah, so pe yeah. people usually start very young. As one of my yeah. mentors said, you you were built to do interviews and to write. 
Da. Yeah, but yeah, yeah ta- 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 one can develop talent at any age, but to really succeed, it's it's better to start young. And people who start young are naturally interested in certain intellectual ideas and technological ideas. So like Steve Jobs. Yeah, you know, these, these are people that are curious from day one. Now, why person A and not person B, right? I have no idea. Um, but, you know, we talk about children. Well, you know, people, children already age five, six, seven, some of them are already very curious, very um, insightful, and they're not really children in the sense that we tend to think of them. And, you know, by the time they become 10, 11, 12, 13, they're, if given and put into the right environment, they're already doing incredible things. So, right, the future is invented by the youth. This, if, if allowed. And this gets back to that type of society, right? We've had a society for, a, you know, it's been known for a very long time that America is a country for the young, Europe is a country for the old. So if you're young, you want to come here. If you're old, you want to go live in Europe where they look after you. And, you know, it's a, it, but this, this country has always been about the youth inventing the future. So are you going to migrate to Europe? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Sultan, we're going to move on and talk briefly about your second paper, exploring country yeah. level institutional arrangement on the rate and type of entrepreneurial activity. And there's a bus. Oh my God, you found that paper. Yes. What, what is it difficult to, to locate online these days? Yes, yes. Well, yeah, that's a very old paper, but yeah, it's an interesting. Yes, the, 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 Go ahead. this sentence is quite interesting. For high impact entrepreneurship, an institutional environment filled with new opportunities created by knowledge spill, spillovers and the capital mm-hmm. necessary for high impact entrepreneurship matter most, not regulation. That's what you say, yeah. not the regulative yeah. environment. Comment on mm-hmm. it. So regula- so we all know what regulation is, right? There are a set of rules. Those rules are set up to prevent people from starting businesses. Right? Do you know how to cut hair? No, I can't cut hair, but my relatives who can. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you, can you go and open a shop and start cutting hair? In no. Jamaica, yes. In Jamaica, yes. Yeah, no, in Jamaica, yes, right. But in most places, right, they'll say, no, you need a license to practice medicine. No, you can't do that. You need a lot. So regulation is to create order. The opposite of that, right, is creating disorder that brings change. And what you notice is that when people become entrepreneurs, they're looking for a space where they can do something that leapfrogs the regulations. So let's think of Uber, because it's a very good example, right? Taxis are one of the most regulated industry in the world, right? Especially when, you know, you get into Europe, my God, to have a taxi takes for, you know, what Uber did, it said, ah, let's ignore all the regulations and we will just leapfrog this. So that's what entrepreneurship does. Now look, about the knowledge spillovers, this is a question about Where does knowledge come from, right? And how does it impact the economy? And, you know, in the last 50 years during this time, we learned a couple of things, right? 
one of them was that right the most important input into growing the economy is not capital and labor right it's knowledge it's know-how right it's technology however you want to define it and then the question is where does knowledge reside and the answer is in people's heads and then the third question is where do you get that knowledge or how do you access it and it's due to density and you get it because knowledge spills it's over from person A to person B. You know, it's like gossip, right? Someone says, oh, what's his name is having an affair with, you know, whoever. But don't tell anybody. Well, that gossip gets out in two seconds. Knowledge is very similar. Um, it spills over through people. And so economic growth is partly about getting knowledge spillovers. But remember, the problem with knowledge is nobody knows if knowledge X can be turned into anything that can make money. Who would have ever thought that Twitter could make money or that Instagram would make money, right? Or Facebook. Nobody knew, right? The knowledge on how to do it was there. And people said, oh, that won't work. That doesn't, it's not interesting. So knowledge is the key input. May always have been. Um, and that knowledge then spills over to other people. And this is why cities are so important. Yeah. Zoltan, you are such a prophet. So I, 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 when I'm doing my interviews, sometimes I prefer not to use the camera because I may be reading or doing something else. So you mentioned right. cities. And at this exact moment, I'm actually thinking about cities because I plan to interview an expert and I'm going to ask him some questions about medieval cities. Mm -hmm. so, so what you said it was just quite pro pro prophetic. <laughs> I mean, you know, the great medieval cities were Italian. You know, the great Italian city-states, Genoa, um, Venice. What's the other ones? Um, Florence. Etc. Florence. These were all centers of knowledge. They knew how to do accounting. They knew law. They knew bookkeeping. They knew, you know. The cities is where knowledge resided, always has, and probably always will. And this brings us to a very important distinction between knowledge and information. The internet is full of information, right? If you want to know the weather, right, the weather is information. You go on your phone, you check. You can see what the weather is, but there's no knowledge on the internet. Knowledge is only in people. And therefore, if you want to acquire knowledge, you have to experiment, you have to create knowledge. And that knowledge is usually in places that are we call cities. You know, yes, that's, smart so, people so, you know, cluster in cities. Yes, yes. But that's the reason is because they get knowledge spillovers. You, you, you know, it was a very famous economist, Robert Lucas, wrote a paper called The Mechanism of Economic Development. And his question was, why is an apartment in Manhattan more expensive than a four bedroom house with a two car garage 150 miles away in Binghamton, New York. And, and the answer was there are no knowledge spillovers in Binghamton, New York. You know, knowledge spillovers are in Manhattan. And that's why people are willing to spend 
like three thousand dollars for a one bedroom apartment to be there. Yes, and and only smart people know how to utilize knowledge. So Zoltan, we're wrapping yes. up, and I'm going to make two quick points, and then I'll end mm -hmm. the interview, and we can speak via email. Yeah. Marijuana. J Jamaica is known for marijuana, and according to multiple studies, Jamaican plants possess medicinal qualities. The government mm -hmm. decided to decriminalize marijuana, and at the time, right. the U.S. government was hesitant about marijuana, but a new yeah. law will be passed to allow marijuana investors to do businesses with foreign banks. The, gov mm -hmm. the government of, of Jamaica decided to overregulate the, the marijuana sector by creating the CLA, the Cannabis Licensing Authority. One foreigner actually said he liked the marijuana sector in Jamaica because it was highly regulated. Big name entrepreneurs like regulation because they impede competition. The moral yes. of the story is that smart businessmen from Canada went to Jamaica to acquire know-how from Jamaican planters and then they left. And the CLA is continuing to impede growth. A country like Jamaica that's poor cannot afford regulation, especially when they don't directly impact health. Marijuana is right. a drug, but a code of ethics can govern the, the use of right. marijuana. The regulation is not necessary. necessary. Mm -hmm. And the second point is about a city. Cities allow clustering. Smart people collaborate in cities with entrepreneurs and researchers. Again, Jamaica is a poorer country than the state, so it is more likely to exploit the gains of cities. The mm -hmm. government had, an, had, a, had a plan to build a city in a, in a part of St. Catherine Parish called Bernard Lodge. And I said, that's a brilliant idea. In, in the city, we could construct a research facility or a knowledge center similar mm -hmm. to Silicon Valley. And because of the revolution in biotechnology, we may rely on animal-based meat less. And furthermore, technology can minimize land use. In Jamaica, it was mm -hmm. said that our arable land is small in, 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 in quantity. And as such, we shouldn't create the city because it was because it's going to affect agricultural production. Nonsense. Be technology allows us to exploit agriculture. The, the percentage of arable mm -hmm. land is not important. In most countries, lands are really arable. What, what matters right. is technology. So because right. of backwardness, more than like we're not going to get Bernard Lodge. So again, cities and growth can only work based on G, general ability and smart people. Mm -hmm. But I am I, not, I, I, this is a, a story I've shared with friends and people like you, foreigners who are smarter than myself and well-read. I don't share it with average people because they, they won't, they won't get, get it, Zoltan. They won't get it, yeah. No, they won't get it. Come on, let's be, a country like Jamaica needs a city. Saying that the city is impeding agricultural production is nonsense. There's a biotechnology yeah. re revolution. Who cares about land? Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> And, you know, one of the innovations today is <clears throat> growing food in, in buildings. Exactly. You know, these, these semi sky, and it's all about technology. Yeah, but yeah, so. it was a pleasure to speak to you, Zoltan. But these days I'm doing shorter videos, but I enjoyed the conversation. So, bye. All right. Great. Yeah. All right. Then, bye.